Hey, welcome back everyone to a basic conversation. And I'm sitting alongside Father Jim Basic. And uh, in this podcast, we're going to explore deeper uh, some of the themes that were brought up in Bridging the Economic Divide, a lecture that Father Basic gave. And it's good to be with you again, Padre. And uh, when we talk about this idea of widening gap that exists in our country between the well-off and the poor, you started off by really letting us all know that it really has to deal with uh, income and wealth, and wealth being accumulated assets. Right, exactly. We made that distinction. But before we go into that, I need to make disclaimers. Here we go. (laughs) I know very little about (laughs) economics. You're not a Milton Friedman? (laughs) No, I mean, I read the stuff. And frankly, in preparation for the lecture, I did try to read up on stuff and and learn more about it. But... uh, don't ask for a total explanation of hedge funds or anything as part of this. So, um, yeah, I, I'm very limited. See, it's a general problem. Of what does a theologian do in dealing with real life issues? Mm. And none of us who are in the world of theology can be an expert on anything, on business, economics, anything, you know, and we have to borrow and take our clues from from other people and try to figure out one of the things that Pope John the 23rd taught us we have to read the signs of the times Hmm. and if we're going to make telling comments or say anything useful out of our Christian perspective we got to know something about the world in which we're living and so that was my minor effort to know something about uh, the disparity in both wealth and in income. But that you brought that up in the lecture, though, that when some of the moral threads of this economic gap would be brought forward, the economists and others might say, well, the clergy really don't understand the markets yeah. or economics. Yeah. That's a way of putting, keeping you in your place. Yeah, for sure, and keeping Pope Francis in his place, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> because Pope Francis has wanted to talk about the, these kind of problems. In fact, uh, you know, one of the telling statements that he made was that uh, inequality is the source of so- all social ills. Mm. Uh, he, he's in line with this with this guy uh, Piketty. He's a yeah, French a uh, economist. Yeah. Uh, and wrote the, uh, what was it? Uh, capital in the 21st century. Yeah, yeah, Capital in the 21st century. And and his big thing is, I got it. I didn't read the whole book, Brad, mm-hmm. let me confess. It's cliff, 530, the cliff notes. Yeah, 530 <laughs> pages. Um, but um, what I got out of it was that inequality is a bad thing. It's hurting the world. It's going to hurt the, hurt the rich and the poor. It's going to hurt democracy and so on. And unfortunately, it's growing mm. and uh, becoming worse, the inequities, that the people with money are making more money because of capital investments. they got stocks and so on. They keep going up faster than ordinary people's wages go up. And he keeps saying, this is a problem. Thomas Piketty. What was the title again? Capital Capital in the the 21st century. Yeah, right. And uh, it got a big play. In fact, it was on the New York Times bestseller list at one point. I mean, how many people buy a 530-page economics book? But um, people were saying, like, uh, that it was one of the most important works. But my point was that he was saying the same thing the Pope was. Wealth and income inequity is a bad thing. And it's hurting the whole culture, the whole society, and is bad for both, eventually bad for both the rich and the poor. Yeah, because uh, if the poor, the, it becomes a permanent class. Yeah. And then also the resentment or the anger can lead to other social ills, right? Crime yeah. and... Yeah, yeah, I, I, yes. That was sort of one of the authors I consulted was saying that um, when young people in the ghetto see no way out, you know, they they think of themselves, they're either going to prison or they're going to get shot to death, right? 
uh, that's how they see their future, and they become desperate and and do things, maybe uh, resort to crime in a ways that that are not helpful. Yeah. yeah. Where others and more economically established will say, "Well, get a job, stay out of trouble, be right. a good citizen, and things will work out. You'll be like me." Yeah. That's kind of a simplistic One description. Might. Catholic parishioners, you know, talk like that. I said, you know, I'd like to put you in the ghetto with no resources, no mother who read to you when you were five years old, you know, and an inferior education, and your brain didn't get developed, you know, and let me see if you can get out. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's try to try to create some empathy for uh, the down and out. I yeah. mean, uh, anyway. But one of, the, one of the third rails, the lightning rod uh, that you talked about was this idea of wealth rest, rest, redistribution. Yeah. And no one really wants, embraces that concept. Just Well, the Chicago School of Economists doesn't like that word. Yeah. <laughs> Let the market work. The free yes. market will help all of us, you know. Yeah. Uh, the rising tide will float all boats, yeah. John Kennedy's metaphor. Mm-hmm. Or, and, uh, yeah, they, they, when the Pope talks about sharing the wealth or redistributing the wealth or getting incomes closer together, the, their big line is he doesn't know what he's talking about, you yeah. know. He, he keeps talking about well, the unfettered market is a bad thing. And he, the Pope spoke out explicitly against trickle-down economics, which has played such an important part in our conservative economic outlooks. And the Pope says that doesn't work and uh, we have to find other ways. And their line, you know, and I, there's published works along this line is, the Pope is out of it. He doesn't know what he's talking mm-hmm. about. Uh, you know, let him talk about family life or something, but he's not going to tell us how to deal with the economics. Right. And the argument for the Chicago economists or conservative economists would be that if you did try to do something like that, it disincentivizes yeah. growing wealth, and right. then it also creates a permanent lower cl- dependent class. Yeah. And that argument's still going on yes. today, right? Yep. And whether you're going to have a capital gains tax or not, uh, that's always the thing, yeah, that you're going to... The free market will solve all problems. Um, and the Pope says, well, unbridled capitalism is uh, not healthy for the world. And the, the economists, I think, rightly say, well, there is no unbridled capitalism. Right. You know, we have a government who still has a role to play in the economic world. So they say, well, show me an unbridled capitalistic system someplace, and and then we'll talk about it. But, of course, there isn't. And so uh, they make, I think, a pretty strong argument in that way against some of the things the Pope says. And there's some feeling uh, or sentiment as far as conservative economics would be that it should be done instead of government handouts. It should be done in charitable ways. Yeah. So in the best of all worlds, people that are making great money would somehow figure out a way to share that. Yeah, yeah. That, there was a big conference of um, conservative Catholic economists, and there was a whole chapter in their summary work on the importance of charitable giving. And the argument was that if the government imposes redistribution, it's going to incentivize people and they're not going to work hard and yeah. the entrepreneurs aren't going to create new jobs and so yeah. on. And their alternative was, you know, get people to be philanthropic. Well, that's an interesting comment because look at somebody, look at, well, the Rockefellers, you know, back in the, in, when they started their philanthropies and so on, how much good they did. But the great example to me today is Bill Gates, 
and Melinda. Yeah, Melinda Gates, yeah. Melinda, yeah. Melinda Gates, I think, has a sense of Catholic social teaching, mm -hmm. and um, it's part of her DNA, and I think she's a major mover in the Gates Foundation, and they have their problems, as we know. Mm -hmm. um, but um, they, found, they have uh, done great work, and they have, found, they have hired people to help them to know how to help people. They've helped people in Africa with clean drinking water and so on. And they got this massive amount of wealth, and they're using it for good. I always think of Warren Buffett in that regard, who also has, uh, I think Bill Gates is still the third richest man in the United States, and, and, um, and uh, Warren Buffett is like fourth or something. <laughs> But Buffett said, the Gates have done such a great job. Instead of me trying to invent a new philanthropic way of helping people around the world, I'm going to give my money to the Gates Foundation. Mm -hmm. I don't really know if that ever happened, but it was a statement of his that seemed to me to be socially enlightened. So these people have done great work. I have friends, Brad, I got friends who have money who have done great things. They've helped uh, people, poor people. They've helped struggling students, yeah. uh, charitable giving, w wonderful stuff. Um, and so I don't want to downplay that, you know, but the problems are so massive, it's hard to imagine how you're going to overcome some of the disparity. Not going to overcome all the disparity. There's always going to be a big gap, right, between incomes and of the CEOs and of the ordinary workers in the company. Uh, you know, you don't get equality, right. you know, but um, that you need larger changes. Yeah. And even for our country, obviously, capitalism is held in high regard and the term socialism is yeah. deemed bad. Very bad. So yeah. anything to do with that leads towards that redistribution of wealth, right. the term socialism gets thrown at it, right? Right, yeah. And it kind of shuts it all down. It puts yeah. everyone on the defense. It's a very powerful political word. Yes, it is. And um, has tremendous negative influence. You know, in the, the Catholic Church, has tried to work on the economic problem ever since 1891, when mm -hmm. Pope Leo XIII wrote the first great Catholic social encyclical, Rerum Novarum, on new things. And he was dealing with the new industrial age and so on, and made the big point of that um, workers ought to have the right to organize in unions so they would have a power more equal to the great entrepreneurs and so on. So so we've uh, constantly throughout history, the, the, the papal encyclicals, part of what we call Catholic social teaching. It's actually a book, Brad. It's called Compendium of Catholic Social Teaching, officially published by the Vatican, which has the, the great social themes of Catholic social teaching. So they were They've always been uh, uh, against socialism. And, of course, in, in the communist period, the Catholic Church was really strong against all of that because it was atheistic mm. and, uh, and so on. So there was no—we're we're against socialism, and the Church has been against unbridled capitalism— so what's but, the third way, I think? Yeah, said, right? and there, we haven't right. ever found one, right. I put it that way. Right. The popes are writing these great encyclicals and so on. Well, what what's the substitute? I mean, what's the third way? And they haven't really come up with a viable kind of third way. So and for most of us in the United States, it's how would you tinker with our capitalistic system yeah. to make it somehow more humane or more equitable? And you... Uh, during the lecture, you, uh, I guess, tried to frame a possible third way by looking at the life of Jesus yeah. and Scripture. Yeah. And I think you framed it as like maybe some guiding principles to think about as we're looking at this idea yeah. of keeping the best of capitalism but also dealing with some of the downsides of capitalism. Yeah. I mean, always, as Christians, we go back to the Scriptures yeah. as our foundation, right? And uh, we look there to see what guidance we can find in reading the signs of the times 
and showing how the gospel, the biblical message, can enlighten our efforts to do better. And so th those great themes are important. The Exodus in the Hebrew Scriptures is the key, right? The, the Jewish people find themselves slaves in Egypt, and what God frees them from that. You know, they were, had the cruel fate of slaves, and God heard the cries of, their, of his people. And he, under the leadership of Moses, he leads the people out of Egypt and in, in, into the, eventually into the promised land. So he's given them social and economic and political freedom. That's the message of the Exodus. Mm. And of course, all the prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah, you know, they have a social message. Uh, true religion isn't just offering sacrifice. True religion is taking care of the widows and the orphans and the aliens. You know, God hears the cries of the poor. So those themes are absolutely crucial to, to the whole biblical understanding of this question of economics and wealth disparity. And then, as you pointed out, it all comes down to Jesus then and uh, his great teaching. I always think that when it asked, you know, who's my neighbor that I'm supposed to take care of, he doesn't give a theological explanation. He says, well, let me tell you a story. This guy got beat up and he's on the side of the road and the priest passes him by and others pass him by. But the Samaritan, the hated stranger, picks him up, fixes him up, puts him up and pays for his time in the inn. Hmm. That's what the love of neighbor is about. It's concrete. It's messy. It's a sweaty business helping to uh, find our way to live in greater uh, equality in our country. And so, yeah, Jesus, the liberator of captives. Mm -hmm. Luke 4, and that's when Jesus starts his thing. He says, you know, he comes to announce the good news. The captives will be freed. The poor will hear the gospel message preached to them. And so there's a constant uh, effort in the New Testament to portray Jesus, especially in the Gospel of Luke, to be the one who uh, cares for the poor and so on. You brought up uh, the Beatitudes and the blessed are the poor versus blessed oh, are yeah. the poor in spirit. Talk more about that. That's intriguing to me. Yeah, well, the background is that uh, the, go the three gospel synoptics are very similar, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And the general theory of common and scholars today is that Mark wrote first in 70 and that Matthew and Luke copied from Mark and changed them. They weren't eyewitnesses, so they used Mark as their major source. Mm -hmm. And they had a second major source that we don't have. It's called the Q document, the source document. And in there, you have things you wouldn't know otherwise, like the Our Father and the Beatitudes. And so the question is, so when you look at Matthew and Luke, they, they tell, they have Beatitudes, okay? And where did they get them? They're similar. And they didn't get them from Mark, because they're not in Mark's. They got them from Q. And so now the question is, well, the difference. So Matthew says, blessed are the poor in spirit. And Luke says, blessed are the poor. So there's a much harsher, stricter, realistic statement in Luke. Blessed are the poor. Yeah, for sure. Then blessed are the poor in spirit. <clears throat> so the question is, which is the original? What did Q, which we don't have, Right. a written document, what, what, what was in Q. And many scholars would say Luke is probably more accurate in saying blessed are the poor, and that what Matthew did was soften it for good pastoral reasons. And that beatitude in Matthew, blessed are the poor in spirit, opens up a conversation for all of us, you know, because mm. we can all, we're not, you and I are not poor, right? right? But we could be poor in spirit. Right. We could uh, have a feeling for the poor. We could be use the resources God has given us to help the poor, and so on. So, I, I mean, I tend to, to agree with the scholars who think that Luke is pri is uh, faithful to the original yeah. Q document, and that what the original thing that Jesus said was, "Blessed are the poor." And it has cha that statement has challenged for those that are in better economic status, yeah, right? So what sure. does that mean? What, am I not blessed? Am, 
So it yeah. gets into all, it, 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 it's a challenging statement. It is, and yeah. part of Catholic social teaching is a doctrine we call the preferential option for the poor. It comes out of Latin America, preferential option for the poor. And um, the uh, Pope Francis loves to use it and so on. So what does that mean? Does that mean God loves poor people and doesn't love affluent people like us? No, and right. that's not what it, what it means. God loves all people, and uh, God wants all people to flourish and so on. But when you look at the world as it really is, and how the church uses its resources, and how we preach about our situation, that there is a way in which we have to be attentive to the poor because God hears the cries of the poor. That's why the biblical background is so important. Jesus is the liberator of captives. Mm -hmm. Jesus did reach out to the people on the margins. And so that, that it sets a pri a certain priorities for the church. In other words, a, a parish shouldn't be just all about taking care of its own, but a Catholic, good Catholic parish should have programs to help the poor, right, or right. to feed people, or to help the parishioners learn how to be charitable in helping others. So preferential option for the poor is one of the themes that, that yeah. cause people, you know, I always say when Pope John Paul II traveled around to different countries, he, al he almost always wet, met with the wealthy, the powerful. Not that he met with the poor too, but he would meet with them to and his message was something like, hey, you've been blessed. Mm -hmm. You better help the other people. And he went out of his way to do that, often without fanfare. I give Pope John Paul II a lot of credit for that, that um, meeting with the, with the well-to-do, the powerful, and saying, hey, you people can make a difference in the world. Right. You know, we now, need you. We need you, exactly. Yeah, right. you know? And you, the third way piece, you provided like three bullet items that were really powerful um, and challenging. This idea of the common good, the second one was solidarity, the third one was universal destination of goods, of yeah. St. Ambrose. Yeah. Um, I guess the one that I would take off on right now would be solidarity. Mm. Again, Pope John Paul II said that solidarity is a Christian virtue. And as a virtue, it inclines us to see that we are all members of one human family, that there are spirit ties that hold us together. There are bonds that are more deeper than anything that divides us. And so we're part of all of that. We're part of a larger group. And the story that I love about all of that is uh, about Dorothy Day. Dorothy Day is one of the founders of the Catholic Worker Movement. And she lived with the poor. She had a hospitality house in lower Manhattan. And uh, she took in the poor, took care of incontinent men and uh, drunkards and so on. Uh, so she was a great uh, model of caring for the poor and of, of trying to get systemic change. So Robert Coles, who became a famous author, psychologist type, um, was finishing his exams at Columbia, and uh, something prompted him to get on a subway and go down to Lower Manhattan to Dorothy Day's hospitality house. Why, we don't know. So he got there, and here's Dorothy Day off in the, she dressed simply and lived with the poor and so on, and she's talking to this drunken woman and the drunken woman uh, is going on and on, and so on. Dorothy Day is listening very calmly and respectfully, and so on. finally the woman stops her tirade and so on. And Dorothy Day gets up and walks over to Robert Coles and says, "Are you here wanting to talk to one of us? One of us." One of us. That Robert Cole said, I oh, wrote a whole biography of Dorothy Day. One of us. Uh, yeah. And are, you here to well, see, are you here to see one of us? And so that, that changes everything about the way we think about this question. One of us. So we would say, well, there's a 20% in the city of Toledo living below the poverty line. This is a bad thing. It's another thing to say, some of us in Toledo are living below the poverty line. 
It changes the whole way we think about it. This is what solidarity means in reality. Some of us have a lot of money. (laughs) Some of us uh, um, are generous to help the poor. Some of us are in the ghetto and don't know how to get out. Some of us are on drugs, and and that's the only way we can think of to support ourselves. Some of us changes everything. And one of the phrases you use, and I'm not sure if this was from Dorothy Day, this idea of we should strive to accompany the poor. Yeah, that's Pope Francis. Pope Francis. Pope, Pope Francis, very big on accompaniment. That's always what he's saying when we're people are down and out. What should we do? Accompany them. Walk on the journey with them. Just walk with them. Just yeah. be with them. Just be present to them, you know. A lot of times, isn't well. I, I don't. I can't figure out how to solve your problem, but I'm here. Yeah. I'm available. I mean, I think that's. I like that phrase. I'm available. You need help. I'm available. I'll walk with you. And w- when we walk with people, it's remarkable what we can learn. Right. <laughs> you know, because we see another way. And it, it removes the judgmental aspect. Yeah. That sometimes kind of occur from people in higher economic status yeah. to people that are disenfranchised. Pa- patronizing. patronizing. The young, the poor people don't want to be patronized. Yeah. And solidarity keeps us from doing that. What were those other two you said that we were... <laughs> it was um, the common good. Yeah. And then also universal destination of goods. And I think you attributed that to St. Ambrose. Give back to the poor. What yeah, was when theirs. you're giving to the poor, you're giving them what's already their right. Yeah. That was the idea. Universal destination of goods, yeah. That's um, one of the Pope's favorite, favorite phrases. Um, it means that God gave this plenteous earth and all its riches and resources for all of us. Yeah. And uh, it's not somebody who can control all of it. And uh, it's, it's already um, in God's plan, the whole beautiful meal, meal, it's common meal that he shared. Everyone's involved, invited to the table. It's not that you and I are going to get off of the side and enjoy it all, but yeah. we're all invited to the common table. Universal destination of, of the goods of the earth, all the resources, the food, and the, everything good about our world. It's meant for everybody. Yeah. This whole idea, of, then the third one you said is, was the common, common good. You know. In Catholic circles, that, that's a big word, um, bigger than in the Protestant world. Catholic language is often says the common good. We have to serve the common. God has given us all gifts, and we have our gifts to serve the common good, yeah. which is uh, the common good gives us a sort of notion that we want to create a world where everyone can flourish, where everyone is invited to the table, where everyone has enough to live a decent life, where people make enough money, a living wage, so that they can support their family and find dignity in their worth, in their work. Yeah. Well, this idea of capitalism being something to hold on to and feel proud of as long as we have the moral aspect and that the things that you raised here uh, gives, is really thought-provoking for all of us. And so thanks for bringing those forward and giving us the Christian perspective on the, 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 the gap. Yeah, so the Christian message and Catholic Association does not have a specific answer to all the questions. Yes. How do we overcome the disparity in wealth and in income? We don't have specific answers to those questions, but we have, as you said, a theological perspective, a moral outlook on it that can guide our decisions yeah. and can help us to form policies that might be helpful. And it opens up real debate about economics. I mean, people, it's an inexact science, right? right? The dismal science, as people call it. And not everyone agrees on any of it. Right now, we're trying to figure out what to do about inflation, you know, right. and there's different viewpoints on it. And, but what the Christian perspective is, it's a moral question. And we, that's, you know, let's get back. That's the most important part of this mm-hmm. lecture is it's a moral question what we do about wage disparity. Piketty sees it as a sociological 
issue, an economic issue. Pope Francis sees it as a moral issue and that the teaching of Jesus and the biblical witness give us an outlook and perspective on it that can really be helpful, not with specific answers, but general tone, general outlook, and an assistance that we want to work for the common good, and that all the world's goods are destined for all of us, and that we have to live in solidarity Mm -hmm. with one another. It's some of us are wealthy and some of us are poor. Another story going on, Dorothy Daisy, she, gave, she got a ring, a very expensive ring, and instead of selling it and giving it the money to the poor, she gave it to a poor woman. And the people were mad at her. Why didn't she sell it and get the money and, and give the money to the poor? And she says, what makes you think that poor people don't have a right to beautiful things? Mm-hmm. Wow. Dorothy Day. Real powerful. Let's finish, let's, let's end on that great Great. Dorothy uh, Day, always a highlight. Wonderful. Thank you for bringing, uh, interjecting the importance of the moral aspect of our economics in our daily lives. Thank you. I want to thank you for a great summary at the beginning (laughs) of of the whole thing, better than I could have done myself. I'm just trying to show you that I'm paying attention in your lectures. You paid attention to the lecture for sure, Brad. I love it. It seems the the very least I should do as your your host here of your podcast. Good background work. Thank you. You're welcome.